Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Best. I'm the Director of Public Programs here, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Hammer Forum on the Special Counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 elections and possible obstruction of justice. The Hammer Forum is a monthly series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with the generous support of Andy and Branya Galef. Our moderator today is Ian Masters. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please silence your cell phones, and please note that photographs and video and audio recording are not permitted. Um, we also want to mention a few upcoming programs. This Wednesday, the Hammer's holding a concert to commemorate the Armenian Genocide, which began in April 1915. We will have feature gorgeous classical music by Armenian composers, and we'll have a light dessert reception afterwards. On Tuesday, May 1st, we celebrate May Day with a program looking at how African-American labor is represented in film and television. Also, we've organized a year-long series of programs that explores the technology, infrastructure, and ideas that can transform the Southern California region and could make Los Angeles the first entirely sustainable megacity in the, Los in the United States. The series is called Future LA, and the next one is on Wednesday, May 16th, where we'll talk about sustainable transportation and mobility in Los Angeles. So if you'd like more information about these programs, you can visit our website, or you can sign up to be on our newsletter, there's an iPad in the theater lobby where you can put your name down. So now on to today's program. You should have all received some note cards and pencils on your way in. Those are for you to write down your questions for the Q&A period. When we get closer to Q&A, we'll send ushers down the aisles to pick, collect your cards and bring them up to the stage. If you didn't get a note card or you need some extras, you can just raise your hands and an usher will bring you some more. Please be sure to write your questions very clearly so that our moderator can read them to our guest speakers. So now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. We're going to forgo the usual remarks from the podium and jump right into the discussion. Today we are honored to have Congressman Ted Lieu, who represents California's 33rd District in the U.S. House of Representatives, and he serves on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Lou is also an assistant whip for the Democratic Caucus. He previously served in the JAG Corps of the U.S. Air Force. Our second panelist today is Harry Littman, who was Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Department of Justice and then United States Attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania, appointed by President Bill Clinton. Littman is currently a professor of political science at UC San Diego and is a frequent commentator on MSNBC. Today's moderator is Ian Masters. Ian is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of The Daily Briefing every Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m., as well as Background Briefing on Sundays at 11 a.m., all on KPFK 90.7 FM. Ian has been a senior fellow at UCLA Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations, and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. So now please join me in welcoming Ian Masters, Harry Littman, and Congressman Ted Liu. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> Thank all of you for coming. And um, just one little correction in the in the um, blurb, it, it mentioned uh, the uh, alleged Russian involvement in the election. Well, there's, no, <laughs> there's nothing alleged about it. There may be something alleged about collusion. But let's start with a brief remark from Harry. This couldn't be more propitious, given what's happening in the news on. Monday, um, uh, Mer Michael Cohen has been ordered to appear before a federal judge to explain whether or not he's a lawyer or a fixer. If he's a fixer, <laughs> that means that everything that was seized by the FBI doesn't have attorney-client privilege. And of course, there's a, there's a suspicion that Donald Trump may go up in the polls because of uh, the bombing of Syria, which happened last time, and therefore uh, it may be a propitious time for him to fire Rosenstein. So again, the timing is very good. The situation may be bad. Any opening remarks you want to yeah. offer us? I mean, my thoughts are, as you say, and it's a kind of, uh, we have these breathless days, and sometimes it's hard to 
keep it all in context, but it seems to me that we are at the end of a really blockbuster week, one of the biggest in the, um, the whole probe, and at the beginning of another. And um, for those uh, Watergate aficionados in the office, I, in the audience, I think it's um, very conceivable that the whole Michael Cohen uh, search and its aftermath may uh, prove to be something like the analog of uh, James McCord's letter to Judge Sirica or Alexander Butterfield's revelation about the tapes. That is the big kind of case-cracking uh, event. Uh, not necessarily that leads to the swift uh, downfall of the Trump presidency. I'm sure we'll talk about that. But uh, that just um, really um, uh, garners a treasure trove of unassailable information that really brings home the, the criminal uh, conduct of the, the president before he was the president and possibly of the, uh, the whole administration. But Libby... Comey, Mueller, Rosenstein, it's, everyone is very much in the, in, uh, in the news and it all, everything seems to be a kind of you know, harmonic uh, convergence. And you, you wonder, as you, as you have in the past, how much more of this can happen and how long can we, uh, can we go on? And uh, Congressman Liu, um, obviously this is uh, an extraordinary time and Harry's going to cover the legal landscape, you, you the political landscape. Um, do you want to have a couple of brief remarks before we get into our discussion? Sure, thank you. Uh, first, let me thank you, Harry, for your public service. And, yeah, and thank you, Ian, for moderating this. Yeah. And thank all of you for coming. On May 10th of last year, uh, Stacey Plaskett, Kathleen Rice, and I were all former prosecutors, as well as members of Congress. We wrote a letter uh, to the Department of Justice asking them to appoint a special counsel. It was very clear to us there was a conflict of interest and we needed a special counsel to properly investigate Donald Trump and his campaign associates. About a week later, with pressure from U.S. Senators, other members of Congress, the public, Robert Mueller was appointed a special counsel. And if you remember at the time, numerous Republicans came out and said what a great guy Robert Mueller is. As you all know, he is a war hero, earned the Bronze Star in Vietnam, impeccable integrity, uh, served in both Democratic and Republican administrations. So what has changed? The only thing politically that has changed is he secured a number of guilty pleas of former Trump associates. He has uh, put out a number of indictments. So in other words, he's been effective. And that's what's changed, and, and that's what's freaked out a lot of Republicans and the President of the United States. And now you hear rumblings that the President might want to fire either, either Robert Mueller or Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. So I am a co-author of legislation in the House to uh, prevent the firing of the special counsel. Uh, and we'll see what happens. And, and so let me just conclude on this. Why is even Congress introducing these bills? And by the way, the one in the US Senate is bipartisan. It's because we understand this president thinks lawlessly. We just want to make sure he does not act lawlessly. And Harry, let's, let's sort of get some of the basics cleared away before we get into, into the conversation because I think a lot of people don't understand or they think that somehow this, the Mueller, the special counsel, is rather like Ken Starr who operated under a statute. Give us the, 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 the parameters that he has, because my understanding is that at the end of the day, there's actually no obligation to release a report, and it goes to the Congress, and this Congress may not let it out. So just, just do a reality check on that, if you will. Sure. So uh, in you, as you may remember, in the wake of Watergate, there was a hue and cry to have a truly, uh, the, have the ability to have a truly independent uh, check on possible executive branch misbehavior. A statute was passed, the Ethics in Government Act, the Supreme Court upheld it uh, eight to one, and all kinds of special prosecutors were, were appointed uh, under it for, for grand matters and, you know, uh, Mike Espy and Henry Cisneros and 
George W. Bush, Pat, there, were, there, there was at any given time sort of two or three or four people truly independent. It seemed constitutionally suspect, and Antonin Scalia railed against it, but it, but it, it carried. But interestingly enough, it came to be in the wake of the Starr investigation. He was the last uh, independent counsel. Um, there came to be national misgivings about it, and people thought there, that you just have mavericks completely unsupervised with that regime, and so it was allowed not to, to not to renew. And instead, a um, special there, there's a provision for a special counsel within the Department of Justice, and that's who um, uh, Mueller is. So that's why Rod Rosenstein is his boss, and the rules of the game for him are set completely by a regulation that was passed, an executive branch regulation that says you can only be fired for cause, it must be the attorney general, etc. But since that's housed in the executive branch, it's possible for example, that the president of the United States could just rescind it. It's, and there are no external to the Department of Justice or executive branch kinds of checks. It also means that the attorney general, or in this case, the deputy attorney general, can uh, limit the investigation, say, we don't want to go there, uh, let's wrap this up, that kind of thing, and the special counsel must obey. Now, to answer Ian's question directly, the regulation provides not for... Um, the special counsel to bring an indictment. In fact, the Department of Justice thinks that you can't lawfully indict a sitting president and not even to bring a direct referral to Congress. Rather, the special counsel works in the hierarchy of the Department of Justice. At the end of the day, will present a report to the, in this case, the deputy attorney general, and it'll be up to the deputy attorney general whether to provide it to Congress, I dare say the Deputy Attorney General will, but then there'll be issues about whether it will, will become public from, from there. So we had, as part of the, great, uh, the avalanche of news last week, the report that Mueller is preparing four different reports on obstruction, on the firing of Comey, on the concoction of the uh, memo on Air Force One, on the pardon situation, and on the pressuring of sessions. That'll be four separate reports. They'll go probably in short order now to Rosenstein. Where they go from there will be up to Rosenstein in the first instance. There's a scenario where the public doesn't see them. I think probably, however, we will. And Congressman, my understanding is that with the, the pending blue wave, uh, the, the best argument that the Republicans have to get reelected is that all the Democrats want to do is impeach him. And that they don't have a positive message. So, and they, you've got a billionaire out there running ads about impeachment, which I, I don't think helps, or in fact, actually, it helps the Republican case. What, what's your sense in terms of the, the political landscape going ahead of what, how, do, how do you think the Democrats should tactically and strategically play this hand? Thank you for that question. If you look at what the House Democrats are doing in Congress, we're talking about a better deal, a better plan for wages, skills, and really a better future for all of us. Connor Lamb recently won, actually in Western Pennsylvania last for month. Former assistant U.S. attorney in the Western District of Pennsylvania. <laughs> I, I'm a, I served an active duty in the Air Force. I, I was a JAG and Really, he won because Connor Lamb is also a jack uh, in the Marine Corps. <laughs> uh, I digress. Okay. Uh, so we're focused on a very economic message. And what's different about a midterm election in a, than a presidential is in a presidential election, all their oxygen is sucked up by two presidential candidates. In a midterm, you can run over 100 different congressional elections. Uh, and the candidates can talk about how they will help their district and be very focused on local issues. And that's what you're going to see multiple candidates do uh, this November. If you look at the field, Democrats are targeting over 100 seats. Some of those seats, Democrats will win if Democrats do one thing. They just get Democrats to vote. Because a number of those districts, either Hillary Clinton won or Barack Obama won twice. Then the districts like Connor Lambs, where you got to get some independents and moderate Republicans to, to vote with you. 
but we let those candidates go ahead and, and deliver the message that they need to for their individualized district. Um, so I think we have a, a, a pretty good strategy for this uh, this coming November. And Harry, recently the New York Times reported that the that the well this this was the sources were close advisors inside the White House. They were worried that the Michael Cohen situation was even worse than the special prosecutor. In other words, Trump is more worried about Michael Cohen than he is about what Robert Mueller's gonna come up with. Is that something uh, you understand to be the case? He hasn't mentioned it to me, <laughs> but it stands to reason. I mean, he's always, he's, he drew that line you know, with some arrogance, but obviously fear of all the hijinks that he'd lived his life by before he was a presidential candidate. Cohen is the eternal fixer for him, uh, and even more, he's sometimes called Trump's sixth child, he's sometimes called Tom Hagen uh, after the, uh, by himself, by the way, he's, he's, he, uh, he likes this appellation, uh, but, uh, and um, if there are bodies buried from pre-2016, you have to imagine that he, he, he knows about them and possibly has documented one of the bone-chilling details that came out over the weekend is this possibility that he he had some tapes and he has you know kept tapes of certain uh, uh, phone calls which I you know you just have to imagine makes makes um, uh, you know Trump want to have a stroke <laughs> um, one other very big thing that I you know I'm sure everyone here knows but I'll underscore the technical um, importance of it this went from Mueller who came across activity to Rosenstein, always again within the department, who referred it to the Southern District of New York. They, they've been surveilling him for months. The whole investigation is there. If Robert Mueller were fired tomorrow, it would affect not a whit the investigation and the possession of that evidence by the Southern District of New York. And they are the bulldogs, or they're known as the Sovereign District of New York in the... Uh, within the Department of Justice, they, they, they give no quarter and are absolutely uh, ferocious. So assuming there's some bad things under rocks there, uh, which it's very much stands to reason, yeah, having, um, even if Mueller is apolitical and upright, he's still, through Rosenstein, subject to the temporizing of the political process not the Southern District of New York. So C Cohen is really in it for the long ride with them, and it just seems like everything on Cohen, Trump is a quarter step uh, uh, behind. The judge said on Friday, as you mentioned, he, that Cohen doesn't even seem to be a lawyer in terms of his work with, with Trump, which augurs quite a bit for the, the attorney-client privilege. So I can imagine the freak-out factor is double on that. I agree. And Congressman, the... Um the, the, the bombshell book is coming out on Tuesday from uh, former FBI Director Comey. And what we've learned so far, or at least the takeaway line, is that uh, Comey described uh, Trump as acting, uh, using the Oval Offices and acting like a mob boss. It could actually be worse. He, might have, might, he may be a wannabe mob boss. But <laughs> the long and the short of it is that this is an extremely difficult needle to thread, isn't it, for a former public servant to go public, he obviously feels very strongly about it. He wants to get this message out. But uh, it's also provoking enormous attacks on the, the rule of law in this country. So that's what the issue is. And you've got the president saying that the raid on, on his lawyer was an attack on America. But the argument that, that uh, Comey's putting forth is that uh, Donald Trump is actually an attack on um, America's rule of law. Thank you, Ian, uh, for bringing that up. Uh, <laughs> I'm supposed I, to be the moderator, remember? <laughs> so when the president made that comment, I sent out a tweet. And I said, dear uh, Donald Trump, uh, you and your attorney do not constitute America. The American people do. And to me, it was not an attack on America. It was actually a vindication of the rule of law upon which America depends. 
And what we saw was this amazing thing happen where you had Republicans who were investigating the president request a search warrant because they were so freaked out about the evidence they saw about the president's attorney. So let's take a step back and look at the special counsel investigation. It is headed by three Republicans. You've got Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. You have FBI Director Christopher Wray, who's not only a Republican, but he gave over $39,000 exclusively to Republican candidates. And then you've got Robert Mueller, a war hero and a Republican. By the way, the four FISA judges that approved the Carter uh, Page warrants, all Republicans. And then they refer this to the Southern District of New York. The U.S. Attorney was appointed uh, by a Republican president, in this case, Trump. And they went ahead and upheld the rule of law. So you've got a number of Republicans working in our government uh, who every day are vindicating the rule of law. And to me, that gives me hope. And let me just say one more thing. Uh, about Michael Cohen. Can we just take a step back and go, why does Trump need a fixer, um, right? You would need a fixer if you routinely engage in immoral or illegal conduct. And I think we're gonna see uh, stuff come out from Michael Cohen that the president really does not want to come out. And Harry, I spoke with uh, today uh, with uh, Peter Stone, with McClatchy who broke the story that uh, Michael Cohen um, did in fact go to Prague, as is uh, mentioned in the Steele dossier. How much if, do you feel that this Steele dossier is sort of uh, uh, the kind of hangman's noose here lurking in the background? Uh, as far as I know, very little of it's been disputed. Yeah, that's the big point. I mean, there are, there are lurid and, and sensational details, not just the salacious ones, but the, I mean, the whole kind of scenario blows your mind, but then you think, you know, what exactly is implausible in the whole idea? Is it implausible, say, that, that Putin and the Russian government would have surveilled Trump every time he was there? Is it implausible that he would have done something um, untoward? Is it implausible that, that certain people in his, in his orbit would have been, uh, you know, approached? Nothing, you know, seems not to ring true. And Steele has been roughed up quite a bit, but he's a very uh, respectable, he was, uh, you know, a well-known um, uh, member of the M16, essentially the FBI in, in uh, uh, England. The CIA. I'm sorry, the CIA in England before. And th as they said to, the, to the, uh, the, the FISA judges, this part of it has always seemed the most both terrifying, I mean, an actual Manchurian candidate kind of scenario, and far-fetched, and, and, and yet, uh, exactly as you say, Ian, there's been, you know, not only has there not been a, a, a definitive rebuttal of, of it, chapter and verse, I'm not sure there's a verse or a half a sentence that's been firmly rebutted. I, you know, if I don't know, if I were omniscient and it turned out that the the, the, the hijinks with the prostitutes didn't happen in the hotel. I mean, I think we'll never know exactly about about that. But um, the the rest of the details have have yet to be uh, uh, firmly rebutted. And I, let me just say one more thing: if they're true. What they point to is the genesis of a whole bunch of nasty business, starting with the Miss Universe uh, contest in Russia a few years ago, and the tr and the efforts to build uh, Trump Tower, and then the whole kind of cast of characters in Russia and in the U.S. and on Trump's campaign kind of blend together and really do potentially um, give rise to a collusive conspiracy. And Congressman, I mentioned uh, earlier that this last time the 59 cruise missiles a year ago went into the Syrian airbase, uh, Trump went up in the polls. So it's conceivable that following uh, the Friday night strike, he may go up in the polls again. Uh, would that make you nervous? It certainly makes me nervous that that might be the opportunity for uh, the president to um, remove either Rosenstein, uh, Sessions, you name it, um, and there's talk even of having Scott Pruitt, under the Vacancies Acts, become the new Attorney General because he's already been confirmed. So, um, the one thing that you keep hearing people say is, if that happens, 
we'll have a constitutional crisis. Well, will it be a constitutional crisis? Will the people take to the streets? Or will he get away with it? Donald Trump is not going to get away with it. <laughs> so there are three backstops to why he's not going to get away with it. The first is you, uh, the American people. Uh, MoveOn.org, a few days ago, sent out uh, information. There's already over 800 events scheduled nationwide for people to take to the streets and engage in marches and rallies and protests. And if you thought the Women's March was large, I think you're going to see even larger marches than what has happened. The second backstop is you have these career prosecutors and FBI agents at the Southern District of New York and the Department of Justice. They're going to keep on doing their jobs. And just because you replace someone at the top doesn't mean that you can shut down this investigation. The train has left the station. If they have crime evidence on Jared Kushner, they think he did bad things, they're going to keep going after him and, and prosecute him. If they think there is evidence against Michael Cohen that he committed felonies, they're going to prosecute him. And I have a difference of opinion with the Department of Justice. Uh, I believe that the president can be indicted. Read the Constitution. There's nothing in there that says the president somehow can't be indicted. We know a vice president was indicted uh, in U.S. history. But even if we take that away, certainly Michael Cohen can be indicted. Jared Kirscher can be indicted, a number of other people. Uh, so once that happens, that puts increasing pressure uh, on the president of the United States. So he is not, he and his associates are not going to get away with it. And let me just conclude uh, on Syria real quick. I served in the military. I'm not opposed to use of force, but I am opposed to the unconstitutional use of force. And while the chemical weapons being used by Assad, Assad is horrific, Congress has never authorized a strike on a country that did not attack the U.S. And my view is the president needs to get congressional approval. And since he didn't, it's just another example of this administration violating the rule of law. And this may be a good time to start writing questions, because we, since we have a full house, I'd like to get through as many in the Q&A section. So you have the pencils, you have the paper, and then so we'll have people come by and pick it up. So we want to get moving on uh, the Q&A. So Harry, you, me you mentioned the four um, um, aspects of the forthcoming um, investigation that's going to be revealed by the Special Counsel and uh, Obstruction of Justice being one. Um, my sense is, and is that there's a sort. If you look at the case of Manafort, it seems to also apply to, to Trump, at least that's my speculation. Remember Manafort took $30 million from a, from a Russian oligarch slash gangster, Deripaska, and then he blew it. I don't know what he did with it. He was supposed to invest it, but it disappeared. But Deripaska starts to lean on him, and you don't want to owe money to these guys, I guarantee you. <laughs> so then, uh, that then uh, uh, Manafort gets the job as the campaign manager. And suddenly and all for no money. And, and suddenly all is forgiving. And uh, Terapashka says, you know, no, no worries, no worries. And and we'll e and then Manafort said, we'll even give you private briefings. And then they changed the Republican platform to make it Russia friendly. And the minute that uh, that um, uh, Manafort was fired, Terapashka comes back at him, and now he's suing him for twenty million dollars. And and my understanding is that what Mueller is holding over him. On the one hand, maybe Trump's offering a pardon, but what Mueller's ho holding over him is that, you know, these Russians are going to come after you, and do you want witness protection? <laughs> what do you think? You know, so it, it, it's, a, again, in the category of what couldn't be, and then you start to think about it. Man, let me, I'll say this about Manafort. His intransigence, his... his absolute refusal to cooperate is not a legal move. There's no, he is dead to rights. There is no credible lawyer who would tell him he's got a chance to beat uh, the rap. The money laundering case on him, and there are two separate ones, very hard to have put together. These are, this is such a sort of Navy SEALs of a prosecution team, probably the best uh, ever. But when, it, when it's out there in black and white, forget about it. 
And so he's got to, something else has to be involved. I've, I've written about this and I don't want to, you know, hash it out at, at, at great length, but you know, we talked, maybe he's holding out for a better deal. Maybe he's being irrational. Maybe, and this is one of the four, this is the most interesting thing that Mueller's going to be talking about, the notion of, that he, Trump maybe obstructed justice by dangling the notion of pardons. The idea would be a pardon itself might be constitutional because you do it in open air and there's a political check and people can go back, but with this kind of, you know, QT, just be quiet and we'll take care of you at the end, that seems illegitimate. It's not subject to any any political check. So that could be one. But yes, it could be somebody was just killed again yesterday. You know, is he is he more worried? Would he rather be at Leavenworth than worry about the sort of poison needle for him and his his family? It's a mind blowing um, thought. But if he's a if he became a genuine agent, and he uh, talks, it you know it the uh, he may know better than anybody in the room what kind of terrifying life would be um, uh, in store for him. So it, it is mind-blowing. And, and I just want to double back one more thing that I forgot on the Cohen point, which is if Cohen went to the U- to actually went to Prague and then made a big deal, you know, did it without the passport and made a big deal of how he'd never been there, you know, it, it wasn't to see, to see the Charles Bridge. I, it, it, I mean, you that's something really... Uh, you, you know, but uh, something really Tom Clancy-ish and espionage was happening. So, Congressman, in, in many ways, the, the political landscape's been turned on its head. Um, liberals who used to decry the CIA are now hoping that they'll <laughs> find the evidence to nail this guy. And conservatives who used to be cold warriors and red baiters and, and Soviet haters are now making excuses uh, for both the, the president and, and uh, Putin. So the, the, what's happening with your colleagues on the other side? I mean, <laughs> seriously, at what point will they rediscover patriotism? Yeah. One interesting thing that has happened is you do see more Republicans uh, show more courage after they announce their retirement. <laughs> Uh, so, Trey Gowdy has actually now um, started a number of investigations against uh, the administration. It's just an amazing cabinet of corruption there with Scott Pruitt, um, who, in addition to first-class flights on your taxpayer dollars, he also demanded luxury hotels on your taxpayer dollars. He got a sweetheart deal with lobbyists uh, for a below-market lease. Uh, he is just so amazingly and awesomely corrupt, and now he's being investigated uh, by the chair of the Oversight Committee. They're also investigating Ben Carson, who spent $31,000 of taxpayers' money on a dining table before people reverse that. And you've got other cabinet secretaries spending taxpayer dollars on trips that no one understands uh, why they took. And the last question I answered, I, I now remember, I told you there are three pack stops. I gave you two. One was you, the American people. Second were the career prosecutors, FBI agents. The third is there's an inflection point this November. And the voters in America get to change the makeup of Congress if they want to. And if that does happen, uh, then Democrats uh, will have, I'm going to give you these two words, subpoena power. And that means we can subpoena documents, we can subpoena witnesses, we can conduct real investigations. Uh, So in in my mind, this administration is just not going to get away with the rule of law. And Nixon, right? took on the rule of law, he eventually lost. So, um, Bannon says money laundering will be Trump's downfall. It's very hard to read. John, uh, some, mm, I don't know, the rest of it is a little incoherent. Do you want to try that one? But, um, want to try to read it or answer it? it? Bo- both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, By Harvey but, Wasserman. Yeah, well, he, look, he did say that. And he also has indicated that Manafort can bury um, uh, Trump, and that might be when, when you posit the possibility of the, of the hush-hush pardon dangling, you think about um, uh, that. And, and Trump supposedly has, has said to 
um, associates that he fears what Manafort can do. Let's see, D.C. Johnston said he has done it since 1983. Is this his prime criminal hook? Uh, so Trump has done it since 1983. Well, his pro I, in, I do think that um, it just stands to reason that, you know, that there's so many real estate uh, deals and forays that he was breaking the law and in the time before he thought of himself as a, as a candidate. But I would think the big hook there would be Michael Cohen, uh, if, uh, if that's what we're going after. And Congressman, if Trump uh, resigns, is indicted, or is impeached, will Pence be more dangerous to personal liberties? So, so here's my view. I, I serve on the House Judiciary Committee. By the way, here's a fun fact. Uh, it's uh, the committee that would actually start impeachment hearings if those were to happen. Uh, but my view is impeachment, uh, like Congress's power to declare war, uh, is something that needs to be used never as a first option. It should be something that we do only a force to. It's got to be uh, one of those options that we look at only if the facts uh, in the law warrant it. So we'll see what uh, the special counsel investigation reveals. But if there is massive violations of rule of law, my view is I actually don't care who the person is that replaces the sitting president. If the sitting president conducted criminal misconduct, he just needs to be impeached. And so we'll see what happens. Well, let's, let's do a quick uh, adjunct to that question. If uh, the Trump campaign is found to have colluded with Russia, will Pence be included in impeachment? Uh, you ever see um, that <laughs> statue of those three monkeys, like see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil? Uh, Mike Pence reminds me of that. He's like never anywhere where something bad is happening. So I don't know. I don't know what evidence there is on him. Uh, None of us here are privy to what the special counsel has, so we're just going to have to see what, what the investigation reveals. So, Harry, what happens if Cohen takes the fifth on Monday? Uh, I, I'm not sure how consequential that would be. First, it wouldn't really be on uh, Monday. I mean, Monday is this um, strain, the, the skirmish that's going on now, which he will lose, is to try to have him or a special master comb through the uh, arguably privileged material in the first instance. But were he to take um, the fifth, and he might well, I'm not sure it would matter very much. The, the, you know, the volumes here will be in the, um, the, the tapes, the evidence, what's ever on the phone, the safety deposit uh, box. Uh, you know, he'll be worried. I, I think the criminal liability against him will be easy to establish. And then there's whatever there is against uh, Trump. So sure, if he turns and cooperates and can inculpate him out of his own mouth, that would be very effective. But it, he's in a world of hurt um, no, matter, no matter what. So does Mueller have um, automatic access to all evidence uh, gathered against... Uh, who's that? Uh, Against what? Against Cohen in SDNY. Oh, Cohen, Cohen, uh, yes, in the in the New York case. What do you think? So Mueller would have access if it was related to the special counsel investigation, and there would be a decision that Deputy Attorney General, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rob Rosenstein would decide. Last month, uh, Congressman Kathleen Rice and I wrote a letter to the FBI and we asked for a criminal investigation of Michael Cohen, as well as the National Enquirer, because the public reporting was that they spent vast amounts of money to silence two women who had negative stories about affairs with Donald Trump, and that was done during a presidential campaign to assist the Trump campaign. And our view was that those are massive campaign finance law violations. Anything over $25,000 uh, is subject to being punished as a felony, uh, so we asked the FBI uh, to investigate. It's possible uh, that he may be indicted for, for those reasons, but once they search his home, office, and hotel room, and they get all these other documents, if any of that relates to Russia or, or other issues related to Russia, they can certainly send them to 
Rod Rosenstein will make a decision as to whether Robert Mueller should get them. But I just want to add a mind-blowing detail I hadn't been aware of about the, the two women. Same lawyer. The, each of the women had the... Co, co, that's, th that, by the way, that's a guy who I think is going to turn very quickly and be cooperating tomorrow. Well, it looks like, it looks like he was working with Cohen against his own clients, doesn't it? I, I think that's a fair inference, well, yeah. So, um, will A.G. Snyderman um, pick up charges against Cohen if Trump uh, pardons him? What do you for me? Yeah. I mean, Snyderman's very much in the, in the wings here and has been sort of working and uh, sharing information, but it, it kind of goes back to the... the question the congressman just answered. There's real protocol for how one can share and, ha and, and how not. There's also an interesting statute in um, uh, New York that prohibits, it's essentially a double jeopardy statute, so he, if, uh, if Manafort is actually goes to trial and is, not, and is acquitted, there's good reason to think that he, won't, um, he wouldn't be able to be prosecuted in, in New York. But the main thing, were he to be pardoned tomorrow, um, would um, would justice be served in some way? I think the answer is yes. I think Schneiderman does stand ready, and the New York laws are very wide-ranging and potent, like the Martin Act. And then second, there's the there would be the possibility then of compelling Cohen's uh, testimony, even at the federal level, although, of course, he's so squirrely that uh, it, it's not, you know, that might not be... Uh, very truthful or illuminating. But my bet would be yes, Schneiderman will come in. So here's a good one. Do idiots lie to their attorneys? <laughs> is it possible Trump is lying to his? <laughs> is that a rhetorical question? Let me answer it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> if you uh, look at the Washington Post, um, they did this interesting thing. They tracked everything Donald Trump said for the first 100 days. And then they reported it. And they said, you know, Trump lied over 400 times in the first 100 days. So New York Times didn't want to be outdone. So they said, we're going to track him for six months. Tracked him for six months. They wrote an article saying he lied over 800 times. Then the Washington Post said, OK, we're just going to track him all the time now. <laughs> and it was recently reported he's lied over 2,200 times, made false and misleading statements. It wouldn't surprise me uh, if he also lies to his attorneys. He also just says things that his attorneys would tell him never to say, right? So he fires Comey. A couple days later, he goes on national TV, says the one thing his attorneys would have said, do not say, which is, I basically fired Comey because of the Russia investigation. <laughs> That's just admitting to obstruction of justice. And, and, you know, just because he so brazenly admits to obstruction of justice doesn't mean it's not obstruction of justice. And then you'll say things like, you know, I'm drawing a red line at, at you know, if the special counsel looks at, at my finances. So that's like, you know, if the cops come to your home <laughs> and you open the door and you go, yes, go ahead and search everything in this house, but do not look in the upstairs bedroom. <laughs> what do you think law enforcement's going to do? Harry, is the, if the subpoena is served on Cohen, is the subpoena served on Cohen broad enough to reveal evidence of money laundering. So the, so the uh, it, it, by the way, not a subpoena, search warrant approved by a, uh, a magistrate. It's sealed, but little by little is coming out, which has intrigued me, by the way, because there have been no leaks by the Mueller organization. And the, and the subpoena, and the search warrant wouldn't have been sealed. We actually may be seeing some leaks by SDNY, which would be the first from the prosecution side and wouldn't be unprecedented. But the short answer from what we're seeing is, yeah, seems quite broad. And in any, in any event, the notion of a search warrant is just where you can go and have, a, a, have lawful authority to search. If you have lawful authority to search there and what you find is evidence of money laundering, you, you go after it. So the predicate for why you can be there might say money laundering. Or, or it might not. It certainly says bank fraud, wire fraud, and, and election violations. But if in searching his laptop or his phones or his files, most of which don't seem to be attorney-client privilege, they find evidence of money laundering, 
absolutely they can go forward with it. And there and there there already seems to be that they were looking for evidence of v- closely related bank fraud that by the in the actual hundred thirty thousand payoff. Um, they and they separately have have um, investigated that at the bank of at Cohen's bank out in New York and Stormy Daniels bank back here. So you know, will the coming indictments uh, put effective pressure on Republicans to remove Trump? Say the first part again. Sorry. Will the coming indictments put effective pressure on Republicans to remove Trump? I just see what those indictments may or may not be. And I want all of you here in this room to understand uh, the power you have to shape public sentiment. I believe Abraham Lincoln had it right when he said public sentiment is everything. Uh, With it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And you've seen a massive number of resignations from the White House, even though that didn't have to happen. Why did that happen? Because the American public was not gonna tolerate it. What is one reason that the president still has not fired Robert Mueller or Deputy General Rod Rosenstein? Public sentiment. He understands that the American people just might freak out if he were to do that, and he might have his own party uh, turn against them. So understand that showing up to marches and rallies and protests, doing social media, writing letters to the editor, talking to your uh, workers, co-workers and your neighbors, all of that makes a big difference. Will Jared Kushner be convicted? (laughs) Harry? Such an interesting question. So um, Kushner, have you noticed, has gone completely dark. Right, we on, well, first, fact number one about Kushner, unique in the probe. He's got a very competent lawyer, and I'm just saying that as a fact. Abby Lowell is exactly the kind of professional that is all of, all of whom, and there are a hundred in D.C., are avoiding Trump like the plague. So they're playing it. Uh, he's playing it very smart. But so many things were, point, were pointing toward him, and this is... Close to rank speculation on my part, but Kushner's the last person who leaves the room before the big, uh, before the president buttonholes Comey and says, "Can you let Flynn off lightly?" He figures in a lot of places, and yet we don't believe that he has been in front of the special counsel since November, and then only very perfunctorily notwithstanding which we know that Mueller has completed his obstruction probe of that episode, save only talking to the president, because you wouldn't talk to the president until you've done everything else. So my best read of this is Abby Lowell told Mueller, don't call my guy, he's going to take the fifth. And under such circumstances like that, more often than not, a professional talking to a professional, a Mueller talking to an Abby Lowell will not make Kushner go through the charade of walking to the grand jury, taking the fifth, and leaving. So I, I, my best guess is they're very uh, strong, that he will be indicted, he will take the fifth, and yes, uh, you know, Mueller would not, uh, the, uh, the, he wouldn't be indicting him unless he had a very strong case. My best guess is he, in a year from now, he is a felon. So here's a good question for you, Congressman. Uh, does the U.S. military have strong enough checks and balances to prevent Trump from declaring martial law and doing away with Congress? So I'll answer that question, but first let me talk a little bit about Jared Kushner. Um, By the way, today is Sunday, which means we all have to ask, why is he still a senior White House advisor? And I have no idea. Uh, So I had a security clearance before I entered Congress, and it's this form called the SF-86 form. It's long, it's complicated, it asks every bad thing you've ever done. Um, You have to put in there every foreign contact you ever had, and on and on. About a third of the questions are related to foreign contacts. You cannot go through this form and think the U.S. government does not care about your foreign contacts. So Jerry Kushner fills this out and submits the form. He left out all his foreign contacts. 
news breaks out saying, hey, he left all his foreign contacts out, you may wonder, why, how is this even leaked? Because I think some people were freaked out by it. So then he has to put in a second form. Again, he leaves out some, just happens to be Russian foreign contacts. Then he had to submit a third form. On this form, it says very clearly, if you omit material information, uh, you could be punished uh, as a felony. And I've never seen a case where y you're, you're put in a position that requires a, a very high level security clearance, you don't get it, and then it's a consolation prize to give you a lower level security clearance. That just doesn't happen, you're fired. And the fact that he's sitting there in the White House is totally bizarre because the whole world is looking at this going, all right, we've got a senior White House advisor that the US government doesn't trust because he can't get that high level security clearance. I have no idea why he's still there. And he can't do his job because one of his jobs is, by the way, to get Middle East peace. <laughs> so how does he come up with a peace plan if he doesn't know what the various parties are thinking what our intelligence has on them at the very highest levels, uh, he should be nowhere near uh, the White House. But on to your point about martial law and um, the checks and balances in the US military. If you look at US history, uh, it's pretty clear that our military generals have been against war uh, and, and use of force, much more so than civilians. It's always been civilians that push the military uh, to, to engage in conflict. And you can even see that now. You see that one of the most reasonable people in the Trump cabinet is Secretary of Defense James Mattis. Um, and, and he understands, as other military generals do, uh, the enormous power of the military, but also uh, how it can be used and, and should not be used. And I believe uh, definitely there are enough checks and balances within the military. They, they understand uh, that the military is for defense of the United States, not for domestic law enforcement. And the one thing that all military members are trained and drilled from day one is respect for the rule of law. We're taught not to execute illegal orders, and I have great faith in our military to continue to respect and uphold the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Just to follow on from that, my understanding is that uh, General Mattis resisted tremendous pressure from both uh, President Trump and from the new National Security Advisor, John Bolton. They wanted a much bigger attack. They wanted to bomb the palaces of Assad, etc. cetera. And uh, General Mattis basically knew that you kill one Russian, uh, you're in uncharted territory. And he restrained him, and then Trump ran around him by tweeting out that where our beautiful missiles are on their way. So he had to do something, and thus what happened on Friday. Is that your understanding of what happened? It would not surprise me if, if that's what happened. General Mattis and the US military is very aware uh, that we have an amazing ability to execute missions. We do it around the world all the time. And you may have seen the president tweeted out, mission accomplished. Uh, recently, which harbingers back to President Bush with the big mission accomplished behind him, even though Iraq turned out to be a massive disaster. And I think both President Bush and Donald Trump, uh, who has never served the military, have this misunderstanding where they equate tactical military success with a strategy. Uh, far from it. A st strategic view and outcome is very different than tactically what the military can or cannot do. And as of today, the administration still has no serious strategy. And it caused so much consternation in Congress that on a bipartisan basis, which is somewhat rare these days, we passed a law that required the administration to come before Congress and present a strategy for Syria. That was due in February. The administration has ignored that law. And Mattis, I think, is very aware that if you're going to use military force, you need to have it tied to some sort of strategy. It can't be just sort of disconnected. And that's what we saw in last year's airstrike. It was totally disconnected from any strategy. It did not deter Assad. Not only did he do another chemical weapons attack recently, he's been doing multiple chemical weapons attacks since uh, that airstrike. It's not clear to me why this airstrike would have been any different. And so we need a strategy in Syria, and this administration uh, still does not have one. So, Harry, uh, was there a check on the pardon for Scooter Libby 
And what do you make of that pardon? I said last week was breathless and all these things galloped by and this, this was a little detail. This is scandalous. Uh, as uh, Those of you who know, look, it seems to me that it's one of the, the deepest and most important values in a society whom we want to forgive. It, it's a communal political decision that really speaks to, on the one hand, our you know highest, um, uh, you know most important values of forgiveness, but on the other, the seriousness of certain transgressions. And there is a whole apparatus within the Department of Justice, often in tandem with political recommendations from from people to to really run through the thousands and thousands of pardon applications and you I, I've worked on them some but the point is it's really regularized the way legal important determinations have to be as the person uh, shown remorse how serious was the original offense where is law enforcement here is there some have things moved forward as they th there was recently a pardon of Lenny Bruce Perfect idea, right? For, but, you know, they, he, society has moved forward and we know that was wrong. But it's, it is a, not a casual kind of presidential act. It's a, I think it's a deeply uh, moral and, and small c constitutional act. Nothing. No, no part, as far as we can tell, no pardon application pending in the Department of Justice, but certainly. Nobody tried to go through this. Nobody thought about this in any kind of political or much less moral terms. And as best we can tell, it was the most crass political, basically, I think it was a thumb in the nose to Comey because Comey appointed the special counsel, who, who and they're very close, who prosecuted Libby. And by the way, what were Libby's crimes? It just so happens. Perjury, obstruction of justice, false statements. Uh, so, so you know, doing that that to send you know, tweet storms are revolting. Uh, you know, so much of what he does is crass and small. But the hijacking of the whole apparatus of pardon and completely ignoring, w without a thought, the whole professional um, process in place there. I think it was was uh, truly scandalous. Well, apparently, though, didn't uh, John Bolton also uh, influence the decision? They're very close, Libby and Bolton. Well, you know, in general, Libby has been a cause celeb on on the right. Although, if you sat through that trial, it wasn't because uh, he didn't, in fact, commit perjury and obstruction and, and false statements. It was because he was seen as the fall guy in a political battle and he would oh who else was he who got part the guy who kept the secrets uh and uh that again it's just the resonance for now well uh, and he and and by the way unlike our pile he uh trump has no relationship with libby so it's all this kind of symbol that has nothing to do with that, that is all related to the current uh the current probe and also, it was gratuitous, right? I mean, Mueller is in his face. He's going to try to maybe do something about it. this. Was just a reaching out and a and a uh, derogation of a re of what to me is a really important social governmental function uh, for for some you know trivial presidential gesture. So this is for Congressman Lou. We love you. <laughs> <laughs> Part two, <laughs> how important is the Stormy Daniels case to Trump's downfall? I don't actually care what Donald Trump has done in his private life, uh, but I do care if laws were violated. And just on the public reporting, to me, it's pretty clear the elements of a massive campaign finance violation uh, was met uh, when Stormy Daniels uh, was paid off to some $130,000 by Michael Cohen. And under the 
campaign finance laws, if there was any coordination between Michael Cohen and Donald Trump, then Donald Trump is part of that uh, conspiracy. And it's just hard for me to believe that they never talked about it. I guess it's possible. There's a lot of strange things that have happened with this administration. But that's a hard thing for me to believe. But we'll see. We'll see what the investigation uh, reveals. But as Harry has said, what's so important about this is that's a totally separate investigation going on uh, from the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. And that's just going to keep on going regardless of what the president does or does not do with Mueller or Rosenstein. Harry, some say Russian ads were so adolescent and absurd as to be unbelievable. Thoughts? The Russian ad so, so this is the um, infiltration of, I think, during the election, right. some of the, some of the alt-right stuff. I mean, you know, if, if the stakes weren't so serious, there is a really interesting kind of sociological inquiry about, you know, how, how do those guys over there decide what they want to, uh, tw you know, tweet out? And does anybody buy them, uh, at, you know, at all? But they seem to infiltrate and have a big um, uh, influence. Seem kind of crazy to me, and uh, the, at least some I've seen. But I think they're probably pretty sophisticated over there. I think the crazy ones, the more crazy or may, less crazy, I would say, than vulgar or, you know, Hillary Clinton, did you hear she, you know, fill in the blank. Um, I think they're probably targeted to a certain, you know, uh, audience that, 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 that are ginned up by that. But I'll bet there were, there were others that, you know, were more, were more nuanced. I think they were, when, for keeping Trump completely out of it, the whole, um, uh, you know, episode from of the Russian infiltration is is um, r really um, uh, both worrisome and astonishing. In some ways, bringing Trump back into it, the biggest uh, uh, news in the Comey book to me was they come to him. Comey comes to him and says, look what the Russians have been doing in 2016. You're now president-elect, or maybe he's just become president, and isn't we've really got to worry about this. And Trump was 100% unperturbed, unconcerned about any of the actual national security implications. There was a little discussion going on in front of them. How do we spin it so nobody thinks this affected Trump's election? But, you know, when you hear the, the, the details and the sort of power at, with social media of affecting things and your first thought goes to are, how, what are our defenses against this? It seems very hard to know how to push back. Can I add to that real quick? Yeah, let me give you a, a, oh, sure. a, a, a question that also adds to it. But Congressman Liu, the Russians have violated the registries of 21 states. How are we certain that votes didn't get changed? I'll answer, answer that question, but let me f f first say, to believe that the Russian influence in our elections in 2016 had no effect, you would have to believe that advertising has no effect. And that's just not true. We know that if you put certain um, slogans and images and ideas in front of people on a repeated basis, it does have an appreciable effect. And the Russians were very sophisticated. They knew uh, with an amazing uh, degree of sophistication what things to say to jack up and energize certain elements of the Republican base. It was, it was pretty amazing. And you should read the unclassified intelligence report about this Russian attack. If you just search for unclassified intelligence report Russia, it's the first thing that pops up. It's about uh, 17 pages or so. And the conclusions are very disturbing. It says that they engage in this cyber attack and influence campaign uh, to undermine faith in US democracy, to hurt Secretary Clinton, and to help Donald Trump. And then the second part to, to this question was asked, it also says that multiple electoral boards in various states were hacked. And so this was a, a pretty sophisticated campaign. <clears throat> we don't know if votes were changed. Uh, there's no evidence that any votes were changed. Uh, but I'm not sure you even have to get there. What we do know is that people were influenced uh, by uh, this Russian meddling. Uh, they basically stole information and emails from Hillary Clinton campaign, as well as Democratic members of Congress's campaign and candidates who were Democrats from their campaigns, and they weaponized it, and they released it uh, to the American public. If Special Counsel Mueller can show that it wasn't 
just George Papadopoulos or Roger Stone, but actually higher up members of the Trump campaign that knew about this, or even the president himself, then uh, you don't just have collusion with George Papadopoulos, you've got collusion with other members of the Trump campaign. So, Harry, is this investigation really the best way to declaw or even remove this belligerent from power? Is the amount of attention to this, uh, I can't read that word, and it may be a rude word, uh, from the media and politicians commensurate with what it deserves? In yeah. other words, are we feeding the beast? I feel that way every day, that uh, just covering this, these antics, this, the, the daily, uh, you know, this is government by stunt. Every day there's a different stunt and yeah. we get... Or government by tantrum or bullying or... Hmm. But, uh, so I think it's, it's kind, it's a very interesting but kind of a, 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 a media uh, morality the question. Yeah. The President of the United States, I'm not sure what else you can do. And then I, I think the first part of the question was, is the probe the best way? Now, the best way, if you wanted to bring down Trump, would be to have a, a, a blue wave and an actual, uh, it's, it's just a fact. The, uh, you know, it's been, the, the, in some ways, the, um, you know, Trump is this r remarkable sociopathic figure. You know, you sort of, he is what he is. But the but all the Republicans in in Congress who are who have enabled him and have made this kind of Faustian bargain, they're in some there are some ways of looking at it where they're the most um, you know craven or disreputable of of all the actors, it, it, just factually. And the the best way would be you know a direct influence on on them so that the you know the makeup. Were a, it's true that in Watergate the Democrats were in the majority, but it's also true that really important Republicans and substantial sectors of them, you know, had lines based on uh, principle over party and and felt enough was enough. And you have the a kind of a, 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 a cowing isn't really the right word. I think there's a kind of a a silence to try to just get certain. Um, uh, goals and uh, you know enabled. I, I have a lot of pretty good Republican friends, and ev every single one of them will tell you in quiet, you know, this is the most disgusting guy ever to hold the Oval Office, of course. But and then certain things will come from the, after the but. But that's a pretty big preface, and that uh, you know that so everybody is willing to ignore, and 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 it's a it's a great failure of responsible leadership. If we have five hours, if I have five hours a week, what should I do to help correct the Trump problem? So let me go back to what I said before. I want you to understand the power you have to shape public sentiment because that is what I think is holding back some of the worst impulses of this president. If he believes the American people is going to turn on him and you know, through social media, writing letters to the editor, going and work on you know campaigns that you want to be a part of, supporting organizations that go to the judicial branch every day and fight for your rights. Uh, so last year I became a um, monthly donor to the ACLU. Um, support newspapers. After Spe Steve Bannon last year went on his rant about the free press, I went ahead and purchased newspaper subscriptions to the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, the Daily Breeze for my son. Because um, I already had them. So, what I, but there's a subscription. So, there's a lot that you can do. And for the question that was just asked of Harry, in terms of sort of all these scandals and, and the focus on it, my position is we cannot normalize what should not be normalized. And I don't care if it's scandal number 17 or number 57, I'm gonna talk about it and make sure that we hold it up uh, to the light and people can see it and assess it. And at the end of the day, I still have great faith uh, in the American people uh, as shown by the Western District of Pennsylvania recently. That's America. <laughs> So, Harry, th by the way, this is a question that I get a lot in emails from listeners. Who does your hair? No. 
this one. Huh. It's, it's, <laughs> it's radio. Radio, right. Yeah. <laughs> radio is show business for ugly people. <laughs> By Don't the way, that, that's what Carville said about politicians. That's what they say about <laughs> politics, right. <laughs> All right. There seems to be a lot of speculation, but little evidence. What evidence is there that the Trump campaign did something illegal? Okay. Fair question asked. I, I last week, for the fun of it, uh, went on Fox. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different world there. And uh, you know, but this is a question you hear quite a bit. It's 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 a fair question to ask in a sense. Except what that really means is, why is Mueller uh, not advertising what he's found yet? And the answer is, he's a professional prosecutor. It's absolutely the way you do it. You do it in part to protect defendants. By the way, he's been moving at a at a pretty rapid pace based on other inv investigations of the past. By the way, also, the, 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 the uh, question is, is wrong because we have, you know, Manafort, Papadopoulos, all kinds of things that have come out that are evidence, but what they're saying is, why don't you have the, you know, the, the there isn't the fact that we haven't heard it yet a showing that they don't have the goods on Trump, and the answer to that is absolutely not. It's not how prosecutions work. They gather evidence in confidentially, then they come forward with the evidence. If they go another three years and they come out of the box with nothing, it's a fair question to ask. But really, it's an important American value that, like so many, that are being you know ignored or the question overlooks that Mueller is working, by the way, the most, you could ask, um, uh, Ian would probably confirm, but media people all over are just wondrous at this is the most leak-proof operation they've ever seen in Washington. You always wheedle a little out of this guy or that guy. Mueller, they are absolutely disciplined about it. So it's a black box. It doesn't mean, we don't know what's in the box. That's, that's all that question says. So... If we get, this is for you, Congressman, if we get out of this situation, what can be done to restore the rule of law, trust in the mainstream media, and prevent another Trump? Uh, there is a law in physics uh, that I like. I believe it also applies to politics, which is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we are seeing the reaction uh, to a lawless president. So since this president has been elected, there have been about 40 special elections where Democrats have flipped seats from red to blue. Uh, so last November, we swept Virginia, won double digits in the state house races, flipped uh, the governor's uh, seat. And by the way, our candidate for governor uh, had an F rating from the NRA. He won. We, in New Jersey, we flipped uh, the governorship to Democratic. In Washington State, we flipped the state house for the state senate to Democratic control. We went into deep red Georgia, won three state seats. We went into deep red Oklahoma, won a state seat. And then this year, we went into rural Wisconsin, won a state senate seat by 27 points. Trump won the district by 17, our candidate won by 10. And then we made the history books by going to deep red Kentucky and flipping a seat by 86 points, a state legislative seat. And then recently you saw the Connor Lamb victory in Western Pennsylvania. So you're already seeing, right, the American people react to this and go, we're going to now start putting in people who can be an actual check and balance uh, on the president uh, of the United States. And again, we have career professionals in the Department of Justice and the FBI who took an oath, and they're very aware that that oath was not to the president. It was not to any political party. It was not to any particular administration. It was through the Constitution, and I believe they're going to execute that oath, and I think we're seeing a reaction now uh, from not just Republicans and the Department of Justice, but also American people as to the lawlessness they're seeing and how do we respond and counter that. And only in a democracy, you just have to rely and depend uh, on the American people to do the right thing. And uh, there is a quote from Winston Church, I'm sort of going to mess it up, but he basically said something like, eventually the Americans get to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other option. 
So, Harry, why is the issue of Trump's tax returns being dropped? Mostly money laundering. I know what that's saying. Well, I think there's a kind of exhaustion uh, on the part of the public. They, you know, tried it so hard. The same thing kind of happened with with all the um, the sexual assaults and the women, but it's now come to the fore again because of of uh, Stormy Daniels. Let me just say, Mueller's got the tax returns, so it'll you know we're good. So it doesn't you know they'll they'll uh, buy they'll we'll know we'll know. So, uh, Congressman, why do you think Steele refuses to cooperate with Congress? It's the author of the Steele dossier. So, so let's take a step back uh, and talk about this infamous Steele dossier. One of the amazing things about what this presidency has done is it has caused, I think, the American public to see a whole new set of vocabulary words. And so now they know what a dossier is, right? <laughs> The emoluments clause. I went to law school. I never heard of the emoluments clause. Now we know what that is. Uh, but dossier is just a collection, right, of, of, of sort of files and reports. And so Christopher Teo, Steele does this. And as we say here today, the most that even the most hardcore Republicans can say is that it was salacious. They cannot say it was false. If you look at the Nunez memo. By the way, I am so happy Devin Nunez wrote that ridiculous memo. <laughs> I'm on House Judiciary Committee. We have co-oversight over Pfizer warrants. And it was great because he wrote the memo actually without reading the underlying information. And it was such a horrendous memo, it allowed the Democrats to respond. And we put out a memo, um, Adam Schiff with the Intelligence Committee. And that memo was able to educate the American public and say, hey, the relevant parts of a sealed dossier were corroborated uh, that were used for this memo. So now the American public goes, oh, okay, parts of this sealed dossier have been corroborated. And with every passing month, additional evidence comes out that corroborates the sealed dossier. So you may have remembered a few months ago, the public reporting was that Trump's bodyguard actually said, well, yeah, uh, we were at a hotel and there was an issue with Russian prostitutes and the, and the president at the hotel, but he turned them down. Okay, well, you know, that corroborates a, a bunch of the, the dossier related to the allegation in terms of the location, the nature uh, of the allegation. If you look at Michael Cohen, uh, I don't even know why he's still on Twitter, but he is. And he responded uh, in one of his tweets, sort of going off about how, again, he was never in Prague, which is sort of interesting, because he doesn't sort of deny the underlying allegation, which is all the bad stuff he did there. He was just saying, I was never in Prague. Well, maybe he wasn't in Budapest, somewhere near there? I don't know, but it was a very interesting response by sort of focusing on, on that one issue. Uh, so again, you see additional corroboration of the Steele dossier uh, as we go along, and there was really no reason for Christopher Steele to lie about this. Uh, he actually went to the FBI because he got so freaked out about what he was discovering. And he was initially paid uh, by uh, a Republican uh, and then uh, he was later paid by Fusion GPS. But if you look at this, um, he had no reason to make any of this up. He had no reason to go to the FBI other than that he was very disturbed by the information that he was getting. Why won't Chris Steele with uh, has uh, spoken to Special Counsel Mueller's office and to me, uh, that, that's pretty good cooperation. I think one reason is he realized the Republicans control Congress, and it's not clear to me it would do a lot for him to go before a Republican control committee and talk to them. So, Harry, how do we keep Mueller's uh, report from being suppressed? Well, the, yeah, I mean, the suppression, uh, so there'll be this political process. And it'll come to the to Rosenstein in the first instance, and then to Congress in the the next. So I don't think it's a very um, tangible possibility. It, uh, the congressman would be able to speak to this better. I can't see it happening at the congressional level. What uh, unless I mean, so the real risk of suppression would be it's it's coincident with all the worries about Rosenstein's being fired. The real risk. 
of suppression would be a new attorney general or new deputy who is um, overseeing it and uh, who would make the decision. But wow, what a decision. I, I mean, no way you suppress it all. Do you decide to just give the basic details? It's a little bit like the congressman, I think, was just saying about the Nunes memo. It, it, it was it was threadbare and ridiculous, and then it gave it empowered and gave greater force to the Democratic counterpoint when it came out. There will be a lot of people, including everyone in the special counsel's office, who know the contents of what's given to the deputy attorney general. I just can't see a successful effort to really bottle it up at the end of the day. Here's, here's a, a valentine to you, Congressman. <laughs> for Ted Lieu, any interest in running for Dianne Feinstein's seat? <laughs> You're very kind. Um, I love doing my job as a member of Congress. My colleagues elected me last year as a vice chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the DCCC. I'm very focused on flipping back the House this November. I think it's the only way we get a check and balance. <clears throat> but let me uh, say one thing, because um, it sort of occurred to me. I was beginning to think after a while, because Harry mentioned one of Fox News, that maybe folks will look at the same set of facts, these members of Congress, and maybe there's two realities. Maybe they really look at the facts differently based on our partisan background. And then I encourage you to all read this amazing post by a conservative blogger, his name is Eric Erickson, and he talks about his interaction with a Republican member of Congress who goes on Fox and defends the president. And then they were at a Safeway grocery store, and the Republican member of Congress just unloads on the President of the United States, says things that even I as a Democrat would not say <laughs> about the President. Uh, it's also in my Twitter feed, you can look at it. And it may be both um, sort of depressed and hopeful at the same time. It made me hopeful because I thought, okay, really there is just one reality, one set of facts. It's just that some Republican members of Congress choose to lie about it. And it made me depressed because I was seeing some Republican members of Congress lie about it. So we're all seeing the same thing. Uh, it is not you, it is him. And we just need to understand that. And when Republicans on Fox News try to say it is you, it is not you, it is him. The problem is at the top, the problem is with the President of the United States. And um, I think this November, we're gonna see the American people react in such a way that we all understand uh, it is not us, it is Donald Trump. So, um, we have reached the end here. Uh, a lot of these questions were, about pardoning, which I think Harry answered uh, thoroughly, and also an awful lot of questions were about what happens if we get rid of Trump, we end up with Mike Pence. So that seems to be out there in the zeitgeist. So uh, uh, a final couple of words from you, Harry, and then the congressman. Sure. Um, y you know, it seems, well, look, I have given a, a before kind of a glum final prognosis in the sense of, I, it's, it's, I think there are many pl um, very foreseeable scenarios where, where uh, decisive evidence of criminal activity by Trump comes up, even where impeachment occurs, and it just always seems difficult to get to 67 if we're actually talking about um, removal. On the other hand, you know, I, I second what the congressman just said, I think it would be mistaken of, of Trump antagonists to just assume that all who favor him are impervious to reason. And this, this steady, I, I do, I, I think so, that, you know, there's the, maybe some, but there, there are really a series of seismic events that I think, you know, if they don't completely bring down the whole operation, I think y you, can, you can see him completely weakening it and making A, uh, re-election completely beyond the pale, and B, the verdict of history quite secure that this has been a, you know, a, a terrible misadventure in, and departure from the rule of law and, and constitutional traditions. And you know, 10 or 15 years from now, will that seem like a satisfactory 
or, or constructive end, possibly, even though right now there's so much focus on, uh, you know, a more definitive removal of the president. So, Congressman, a last word? Again, thank you all for being here. It was an honor to be here with Ian and, and Harry. Uh, as we sit here today, uh, the NBC News and Washington Post released a poll showing that Trump had dropped four points. Uh, is now at 39% approval. And if you look at the Trump presidency in terms of approval ratings, he's been between 35 and 40. Uh, and I've basically come to the conclusion that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue <laughs> or he could cure cancer and he'd still be at between 35 and 40. <laughs> and it's because I think most American people have made a judgment on him. And it's very hard to, to change that which helps Democrats because with that view, we've won 40 special elections and you have people who are enormously energized because they see someone in the White House uh, that they're either afraid of uh, or uh, angry with and that's not gonna go away by, by this November. And so I think you're gonna see a sea change in, in politics and keep in mind that Richard Nixon had 70% approval rating, won a landslide re-election, and then he left office because, as Harry said, the American people were not impervious to reason. And as more comes out, I, I think at some point, even some of the president's strongest supporters are either going to turn on him or just give up the way that Speaker Ryan just did. Well, thank you. Thank you to both of you for coming. An enjoyable conversation. Thanks for having us. Mm-hmm.